Hello, everyone. Uh, so we'll get started here in just a minute. You had uh, some time to uh, do this question on a soap bubble. Today is the last class. We're doing the last PDE, and that PDE is Laplace's equation. It's got something to do with soap bubbles, and so that's what we're going to do. Uh, my eye is indeed a little bit better. Uh, on Monday, when the class was supposed to happen, I could not look at a computer for longer than about 10 seconds. Uh, but today, it's feeling a lot better. So hopefully, that'll be back to normal soon. Okay, let's see. We got 81 people have answered. How many people are watching? Uh, okay, that's pretty good then. All right, so I think I'm going to stop the top hat question here. This is your last chance to get in. Uh, Let's see what people are saying. Responses. I don't know. A lot of people don't know. Uh, yeah, it's okay if you don't know. Just take a guess. Uh, next option. Surface tension. The shape of the frame. These are great. Gravity. Oh, gravity. That's a good one too. So I think in this particular setup, with this frame over here, it turns out gravity doesn't matter a lot. So it's true that, you know, in principle, gravity uh, is there somewhere in the equation? Uh, gravity in this particular thing is not a very dominant factor. It's much smaller than the other terms. So not a lot of gravity. Smallest surface area. These are all great. These, this answer is surface tension, the shape of the frame. Smallest surface area, minimizing surface area. These are great. So I want to talk about why it finds the smallest surface area. So it is true that it finds a small surface area. Um, but I think the answer I had chosen, and I think the simplest way to explain it, is by saying surface tension. Uh, and what's going on here is that the soap bubble, when it curves, will pull itself in different directions. So the surface tension tries to flatten it out as much as it can. But you can see at points in the middle, it can't possibly be flat. And so what's going on is the surface tension is pulling it in different directions, and those forces have to balance. And so I would say it's a force balance because of surface tension. So let me show you what that looks like mathematically. So in the middle, in the middle of the soap bubble, it looks something like this. I'm going to do a terrible job drawing it. It looks like that in the middle. So I don't know. This is this is a bad drawing. Let's uh, draw the frame in red. Oh boy. So what is it? The frame looks something like this. This is truly, truly next level bad drawing. Uh, but so let's compare to that. <laughs> let's compare to the picture here. So you can see in the middle, it's not flat. And what's going on is it's curved in two directions. So it's curved upwards to these side pieces and it's curved downwards to these bottom side pieces. And if we go back to my paper, uh, what I would say is the curvature here of this surface, it's exhibiting a force due to surface tension upwards. So this is a force from the upward curve. And that's surface tension. And there is also, because of this other curve, there's a different force, which is going down. And that's from force from downward curve. And that's also surface tension. So surface tension is always trying to pull it flat. And when it's curved, you have a force. And the, the thing that defines this shape is that all the forces are balanced. If the forces weren't balanced, then it would move around until they were. And then it would stop there. So that's what's going on. Let's go back to the. So that's how it decides what shape it's going to be. And I think if you look at this, this curvature argument and you believe this, you can figure out what is the equation that it has to satisfy. So there's a force from this curve, and there's a force from this downward curve, and they have to balance. So the two forces have to add up to 0. So the force, force from up curve plus the force from the down curve that has to equal zero. Uh, 
And it turns out the force just depends on how curvy it is. How do you measure how curvy something is? You take the second derivative. So this is going to be a function. If you write the height function here, uh, well, you could call it h of x and y, but because to match everything else we've been doing, we're going to call it u of x and y. So this is an unknown function. Uh, it tells you how high is the soap bubble at the position x and y. Uh, and the force from the up curve and the force from the down curve has to be equal to zero. That's the same as saying that the curvature in the x direction plus the curvature in the y direction, that has to equal zero. Uh, and that's the second derivative. So this is uxx plus uyy, that has to equal zero. And this is happening everywhere on the thing. So technically, this is at every single point, so as a function of x and y. And this is happening for all x and y. So everywhere on this, on this shape, the forces are, the curvatures are always adding together to make zero. The forces are always balancing. And that gives the equation that drives the whole thing. So this equation is called Laplace's equation. Where did I write Laplace's equation? Uh, I guess I write it right here. Laplace's equation. So I guess Laplace was a famous French guy who discovered this. Um, and it turns out it's for soap bubbles. It's also for electrical potential. So if you if you could see the electrical potential fields of your magic and could see it, uh, it would also look just like a soap bubble. So anytime you have sort of potential energy and it's trying to balance out, uh, it, you can always make some kind of argument about what is the force. So in the case of uh, the electrical potential, that's the electrical field. So you can talk about what is the force. And the, when the force is balanced, you almost always get an equation like this. And so that's why it's called it's Laplace's equation. It turns out it's really important. Uh, that's why people care about it. All the techniques we did for the wave equation and the heat equation are going to work. There's going to be one slight wrinkle uh, to keep your eye on. And so that's what we're going to do today. It, is it also for gravitational potential? Uh, that is a good question. I would say no. It's not for gravitational potential. So it's any kind of potential energy where the, the things have a chance of like balancing out. So like, like this thing can move to find it's kind of like minimize something. And for gravitational potential energy, that's not usually the case. Maybe it's some, maybe if you have like, if you have like a galaxy and it's full of dust, and then you could, you could maybe make an equation like this. So that everything will move around and settle, but I think it'll just clump together. So not gravitational potential energy, but electrical potential energy, uh, soap bubbles, uh, it also is related to the heat equation. So you might have remembered from the three blue, one brown video. If you do the, 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 we were doing the 1D heat equation. If you do the 2D heat equation, the 2D heat equation, in 1D it was just ut equals uxx, but in 2D it's uxx plus uyy. So this Laplacian is also in the 2D heat equation. And so this will also be, this, this same equation will also represent the steady state distribution for temperature in a two-dimensional object. So what that means is if you take a baking sheet, your cookie sheet, and you let it sit in like an oven or something for a while, once it has reached equilibrium, the equation that tells you what is the temperature of the thing at any point at equilibrium, once it's no longer changing, no, no t, is, is this Laplace equation again. So that is another use of it. So it's got a few uses. Uh, we're, we're mostly just going to work on the math, so you don't need to know too much about how it works. You should know that it, it goes with these soap bubbles. It goes with the, the steady state distribution for the 2D heat equation, but you don't need to know anything beyond that, really. OK, so I think surface, surface tension was a great answer. Some people wrote it minimizes area. And it turns out that this force balance always pulling itself to be flat, trying to be as flat as possible, for whatever mysterious reason, does turn out to minimize surface area. So uh, surface tension is like the right exact force to find the minimum surface area. Uh, and that is, turns out that's not exactly true. It's true as long as it's not, the curves aren't too big. So there is uh, some small hiccup here with this equation and the real life minimizing thing, but it's a very good approximation for real life examples. So you can find all sorts of, if you're interested in minimizing surface area, there is a lot. You can go into the, the weeds on how exactly that works and what it is. 
In simple cases, it is this equation. So that's very good if you said that. There is one more important ingredient, and I think some of you guys already know what it is. So I'm going to open up another top hat question uh, on the last important ingredient. So other than surface tension, so surface tension gives this uxx plus uiy equals zero thing. What else determines the shape it will take? And I'll give you um, just one minute to do this one. I think some people already knew what it was. Good time for questions here and for me to drink some coffee. Uh, if you have a question in the chat. Okay, 10, 10 seconds left in my universe. In your universe, there's probably less than 10 seconds left because of lag. Okay, so some people in the last question got this one already. They preempted this question. Let's see. So some people said gravity again. Turns out gravity does not uh, matter a lot in this equation. Actually, okay, I think I can tell you what gravity does. Let's, let's talk about what gravity does. Uh, it's going to be, let's go to the paper. So if, if there was gravity, this, is, this equation is for no gravity. Uh, in real life, these forces don't balance, right? You got the force from the up curve, you got the force from the down curve. If there was gravity, the sum of these two forces wouldn't be zero, it would be equal to gravity. So this is a little aside, what happens with gravity? I wanna show you why gravity is not important. So the force from the up curve plus the force from the down curve, that would be the force of gravity. So we're looking at the case where it's zero. That's the equation we're going to do in, this is uh, section 11.5. Um, but if you wanted to include gravity, it wouldn't change much. You would have, instead of the forces being zero, it would be the force of gravity. And in something like a soap bubble, after you translate this into what it means for the u curve, so this would be the uxx plus the uyy, and you would get a term over here. The force of gravity depends on how much it weighs. And so you would look at a little piece of this, and you would look at how much that weighs, and you would end up with the density. I'm going to call this a row. The density of soap times g. And because the soap is not very dense, it doesn't have a lot of mass, uh, this term would be negligible. So this term, because of this density term, is approximately 0. Uh, so because of that, gravity turns out not to play a big role. So even if you have a lot of gravity, because we're talking about soap bubbles and things, uh, it won't play a big role. If you were going to do the same thing, you could do the same thing with like a heavy blanket or something, or like a chain, then gravity would matter a lot. So, and then I think you would have like a little slightly different ball game. And so that's an interesting question, uh, but that's not what we're going to do. So we're going to look at sort of the no gravity case. And it, for soap bubbles, gravity doesn't matter because the density is so low. Uh, so we're looking at this uxx plus uy equals zero. So we're n we're not looking at gravity. So some people uh, think gravity matters. Gravity, I'm telling you, we're not going to look at. Okay, let's go back. What did what did other people say? People said boundary conditions. Uh, some people are still saying surface area, shape of the frame. I really like shape of the frame. So shape of the frame and boundary conditions, I think, in this thing mean the same thing, and that is exactly right. So uh, everyone who said shape of the frame on the first question should also get that correct. Uh, so shape of the frame I really like is the, the right English word way to describe boundary conditions, which are sort of mathy. Uh, and so to get a fully specified problem, you, you don't just need this uxx plus uyy thing. Let me turn the paper on here. So as you know, as you've seen with PDEs, just having the PDE on its own won't give you an answer. What you need is the PDE plus some boundary conditions. And the way the boundary conditions for this problem work is you should imagine we have a rectangle. And so the picture that was there on the last slide was the rectangle. 
and we've specified the shape of the frame on all four sides. So the shape is specified on these four sides. So you get four functions that tell you what they are. I'm going to call the four functions u bottom, u top, u left, and u right. And so you get four functions that tell you what is the shape on each of the four sides. You know, it's a rectangle. You also have the width of the rectangle. You should know that as well. So let's, I'm going to call this side A and this side B. And so these two things together, these are boundary conditions with four functions. Uh, so U top is a function of X. U bottom is a function of X. U right is a function of Y. It changes when Y changes. And U left is a function of Y. So these four functions are the boundary conditions. Now there's four of them, not just two. Uh, four of them and their functions. And this equation, all that together is going to turn into uh, one solution. So this is what Laplace's equation is. It's the actual PDE plus these four conditions. And you can write these mathematically as well. So I've written the picture here, which I think is the clearest way to see what's going on. So u of x, y is in the middle. It's got these four boundary functions. Uh, but mathematically, you would write it something like this. You would say that u of when x equals 0 and y is anything. So here this is I'm plugging in x equals 0 equals u left of y, and this is for all y. I guess it's between 0 and b. So u left, u top, u right, u bottom are given. They're part of the problem. These are given functions. The same way that in, if we go back on, on top hat, Someone gave us that frame, right? So someone, I don't want to open this. I want to show the picture of the frame again. Oh, no. This is the wrong question. Just show me the picture of the frame. <laughs> OK, so this is the picture of the frame. So just like somebody made the frame, then dipped it in water, mathematically, somebody gives you these four functions, and you are the water. You are the person getting dipped in water, I guess. When you do these problems, it's like some kind of water torture. Uh, you have to find the function u, just the same way the soap finds the shape of the soap bubble. OK, so there's four conditions. This is one of them. Uh, when x equals 0, you get u left. When x equals a, you get u right. And that's still for all y. So that's condition two. Condition three and condition four is the top and the bottom. So here I'm plugging in y equals zero and b. And this is for any x. So this, this one, when you plug in y equals zero, that's u bottom. And here I'm plugging in y equals b, that's u top. And these are both for all zero less than x, less than a. x goes between zero and a. So that is Laplace's equation on a rectangle. You can do Laplace's equation on other shapes, but we are not going to do that in this course. So you only have to know it on a rectangle. And this is the full problem. You have this PDE, and you have four boundary conditions that look like this. Uh, so that is a little bit different than what we did for the wave equation and so on, because in those ones, we had boundary conditions, and we also had uh, initial conditions. Here, there are no initial conditions. So something, something funny is going on. And that is to see, if you're paying attention, that is the next top hat question, uh, which is, you're going to tell me, with this setup, which step of the PDE solving process is going to come out different. Uh, so I gave you a couple options here. So hopefully you've experienced, you've done enough practice problems, you've seen uh, some worked out things, you know how to do a PDE sort of from start to finish. So everything we learned in the heat equation is going to apply here, but there's going to be one little wrinkle. So yeah, I'll give you a minute to do this one. Again, this is a really good time for questions in the chat, if you have any questions.
Okay, 10 seconds left. Okay, let me see what you guys said. What, which step is going to be different? So 16% of people think applying separation of variables will be different. 35% of people think it will be the solving for the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions. And close to 50% of people think it's going to be solving for the unknown coefficients. So if you hopefully you remember now, the way you solve PDEs is you do separation of variables, then you solve an eigenvalue problem to get the general solution. And once you have the general solution, so far, we've used the initial conditions to solve for the unknown coefficients. This problem does not really have an initial condition the same way the other ones do. And so the thing that is going to be different is solving for the unknown coefficients. Parts A and B, those are going to be exactly the same as before, uh, really no changes at all to that. So in chapter 11, if you understood chapter 11.1 really well, it you, like 11.3 and 11.5 are not so different. Uh, so there's just this one little hiccup. Uh, that we're going to have to do, which is instead of an initial condition, what do we what do we have here? And we'll see how to do that in a second. Question in the chat: Is the rectangle similar to the side view or the top view? That is a great question. I would say it's the top view. So uh, what I'm looking at here, I'm looking at it from the top. The function u tells you how high it is. So if u is a big number, that means the soap is very high. If u is zero, it means it's on the paper. And so you should think in the example we were given. Uh, u left and u right were both constants that were like 10. So it was like u left and u right were were up here, u top and u bottom were zero, and the soap bubble did something that went like this in between. So I don't know if you can see my, you can see my finger getting bigger and smaller as it gets closer to the camera. So the soap went something like this, and so u is the height, and this picture that I'm showing you is from the top. Hopefully that answers the question. I think that is a really important thing to make sure you understand what the hell u means Otherwise, all this game of solving for you is kind of, what, what are we doing anyway? That's a great question. So u is the height function. This is from the top view. Uh, so uh, com let's compare this to the heat equation, actually. I think this is a, the heat equation and the wave equation. If you drew the same kind of picture as this for the heat equation and the wave equation, for the heat equation and the wave equation, and this is in the textbook at some point. I think I talked about it as well. You would get a sort of semi-infinite rectangle. So you would have, if you draw a u of t and x, or x and t, I'm going to draw it as t and x because, no, I'm going to draw it as u of x and t. OK, great, here we go. So in the heat equation and the wave equation, there's a time variable. t is the time variable. But if you put the time variable on the y-axis, then you get this semi-infinite strip, and the boundary conditions become conditions on the left and the right. So the boundary conditions that uh, say u of t 0 equals 0, u of t and l equals 0, these are kind of like the left and right boundary conditions. And the initial condition is telling you what's going on down here at the bottom. So the initial condition is kind of like the bottom u of 0 comma x equals, I'll call it u init. So if you compare this picture that we're doing for the Laplace equation, for the Laplace equation, it's all very physical. It's really the height, and it's telling you what's going on. In the heat equation and the wave equation, it's sort of like a, you have to stretch your imagination a little bit. But sort of the boundary conditions are kind of like the left and the right condition on this infinite uh, strip. And the initial condition is telling you what's going on at time t equals 0 at the very bottom of the strip. And we're, we're filling in what happens in the middle. Uh, but the middle goes on forever. That's why we find that as a function of t, and t can be as large as we want. In Laplace's equation, we're on a rectangle, and so everything is bounded between a and b uh, for x, between 0 and a for x, and between 0 and b for y. And in the heat equation, there's only one initial thing. But in the wave equation, you need the initial position and the initial velocity. And so for wave equation, you also have a second piece of information so for wave equation, you also have u t at 0 and x. This is the u initial velocity, init velocity. And so I think when you're comparing these two equations, the only literally the only difference, the only thing that's going to be different, 
We're going to use the left and the right the same. So the left and the right are going to become like our boundary conditions, or a pair of opposite sides are going to become our boundary conditions. And then instead of having two initial conditions at the bottom, we're going to have a bottom and a top. And that's going to slightly change how we get the coefficients. And now my camera has gone out of focus because I've been excitedly waving my hands around. Let me see if I can fix that. This is a good time for questions as well while I play with the settings here. Okay, there we go. So morally speaking, that's what we're going to do. We're going to jump in and solve it now. If you saw the makeup class, that was I did the whole shebang for the wave equation. We did a, an example. We're going to do the same thing now for this Laplace equation, and we're going to solve a particular problem. So from start to finish, doing the separation of variables and all that. OK, so that's what we're going to do. I'm going to do this problem. I'm going to do a special case. We're going to do a special case. Uh, and the special case is, let me make sure I get it right. We're going to say that three of these four sides are going to be 0. So this is the special case where only one side is non-zero. So as you know, like when things are zero, everything is homogeneous, and that makes everything easier. And so this one is sort of like three out of four homogeneous on the boundary conditions. That of these three sides, only one of them is non-zero. So I'm going to say that u left equals zero. That's always zero. U right is always zero. U bottom is always zero. And U top can be any function. This is any function. Let's call it f of x is any function. So that's the case I'm going to do. And this case is also in the notes that are posted online. So I'm going to basically go through the notes in more detail. But if you're getting lost or something, that's always also a good spot where you can check along and follow along and make sure it's all making sense. Uh, so that's the case we're going to do. We're going to talk about what happens when you're not in this special case after we do this one. So we're going to do this first and see how it goes. Then we'll worry about the more general case. OK, so the first thing you got to do, every PDE problem, if someone says solve a PDE in this class, it's going to be separation of variables. So we're going to try the solution u of x, y. We're going to try x of x y of y. So capital X and capital Y are these unknown functions. And we're going to plug that into the PDE. So if you plug that into uxx plus uyy equals 0, that's the equation, then you get x prime prime times y plus x times y prime prime equals 0. So very simple equation. And you might recognize this, uh, how it goes, because it's very similar to the wave equation. In fact, the only difference between this and the wave equation is in the wave equation, this is a minus sign. So here it's a plus sign. So if you do the next step, which is uh, put x dependence on the left hand side and put y dependence on the right hand side, then you get x double prime of x divided by x. That's the same as y double prime of y divided by y of y. So I moved something over. I divided through to put all the x's on one side and all the y's on the other side. And this is almost right. And in fact, this is what came up in the wave equation. But in this equation, when you move the things to the other side, so you, when you do this splitting up, you get a minus sign. And that minus sign is going to be the thing that makes the behavior of the Laplace equation different than the wave equation. So this minus sign, this is the thing that is different than the wave equation. So in the wave equation, that minus was a plus. It was t and x instead of x and y. But uh, the really mathematically, the only difference was this minus sign. And we'll see that how that makes a difference in a second. Uh, are we talking about the corners or the edges? We're talking about the edges. So. You have functions on, on each side. So u bottom of x is a function of x. So you can plug in any x value between 0 and a. And so if you write it out like this, this is 
you can see that as well. You can plug in x values between 0 and a. You can plug in y values between 0 and b. Isn't the bottom a function of x? Uh, yeah, the bottom. So over here, I wrote u bottom of y, and I should have written u bottom of x. So that's very good. So these are. So this is technically this is for all y between 0 and b, and this is for all x between 0 and b. Uh, 0 and a. That's very good. Uh, is u bottom in terms of x, right? Okay, same question. Yeah, so you guys caught that. That's very good. Oh, how are three sides 0? Are we not talking about the initial bubble problem? So in the one that was shown on top hat, two of the sides were 0. Uh, and we're doing an extra special case, which is three sides are 0. So you should imagine that somebody uh, built the frame, but they built it like so that three sides are on the, on the, on the ground and one side is up in the air. Uh, so that's the case we're doing. I don't have any objects like that. Last year I had coat hangers. I could have showed you the coat hangers, but not this year. Uh, so yeah, we're not doing exactly the initial, the, the picture. We're doing kind of like that had two non-zero sides. We're doing the case with one non-zero side. It is kind of like an L shape. Yeah. So it's an L shape and you kind of look at it from the top and, uh, and see what the bubble is doing. So you can imagine, like, just by your intuition, the bubble should kind of like smooth itself out. You should end up with like some kind of like flat down here, and then it smooths itself out and goes up to the little mountain up there. A 3D L shape. That's what we're doing. Yeah, that's very good. We're finding the equation for a 3D L shape. This is what we're going to spend our time doing. Okay. So that's the setup. We've done separation of variables. We have the the x and the y equation, and as usual, this one is a function of x. This is a function of y. How could they always be equal? The only way is if they are both a constant. So we're going to call that constant lambda or minus lambda. Let me see what we call it. Of course, it doesn't make a difference what you call it, except for if you call it the wrong thing, you'll get the perfectly correct final answer. It just won't match the notes. So right now, I'm just checking to make sure that I call it the same as the notes. This is what we called minus lambda minus lambda. So we called that minus lambda. And this gives us two equations. There's an equation for x, and there's an equation for y. And by solving those two equations, we're going to uh, get the equations for the capital X and the capital Y separately. OK. So here we go. So the x equation <clears throat> minus lambda equals x double prime of x over x of x. That is the x equation. And I want to point out two things. Uh, we have on the left and the right, it's always 0. u left of y is always 0. u right of y is always 0. And what that means, so if you take the left and right boundary conditions, that's what I'm going to do right now. So they say that u at, so the left and the right are 0. What do the left and right at 0 mean? That means u at 0y is equal to 0 for all 0 less than y less than b. And u at a comma y is 0 for all 0 comma y to b. So on the left and right sides of our rectangle, we, we were told that the height function is 0. This, this, it's always 0. And what that translates to is that u of 0, y is always 0, and u of a, y is always 0. And this happens for every value of y. And because of our onsatz, this x, y onsatz, that means x of 0 times y of y is 0 for all y. This is x of a times y of y is 0 so that's what we end up with the left and right boundary conditions are telling us that these things are always 0 and we're always multiplying by y of y but y of y is some arbitrary number so this thing can't possibly be 0 everywhere if it was 0 everywhere that'd be the 0 solution so we can cancel out this y of y and what we end up with is that x of 0 equals 0 and x of a equals 0. And that is the important point we're going to use. 
And so this should remind you of the heat equation. When we did the heat equation, we had two boundary conditions. And the two boundary conditions turned into a condition like this on the capital X function. So the left, in this case, it's we have four boundary conditions. But two of them, the left and the right boundary conditions, are getting turned into this x of 0 equals 0, x of a equals 0. And this part is just like the heat equation, just like the eigenvalue, eigenfunction problem for the heat equation. We got this thing over here. We got these two boundary conditions, x of 0 and x of a. And that's going to be exactly the same as the heat equation. So this part, I'm going to write, this is going to be the same as in the heat equation. And it's a, it's a chapter 10.3 problem. And this is an eigenvalue, eigenfunction problem. So all we've done so far is we've used the left and right boundary conditions, like the boundary conditions from the heat equation or the wave equation. And that translates into an eigenvalue eigenfunction problem for the x's. Uh, so that's what we've done so far. I'll write down the solution in a second. This one you've probably seen many times before. This is like the most famous easy uh, boundary value problem that we use all the time when we need an easy one. You know, you can have more complicated ones where you have slightly different boundary conditions or something, but this is the super standard one. Question in the chat, uh, would the only time u of x, y equals constant uh, if the top, bottom are all equal to each other? Yeah, so that's right. So this is some good intuition uh, on what's going on here. So somebody asked, how could it be? Is it possible that u of x, y is a constant? So that would mean that the uh, bubble is perfectly flat. How could the bubble be perfectly flat? Well, the only way is if it's flat on the, on the four outsides as well. So yeah, as if, if all of these are equal, then it's sort of a boring problem. Uh, then u of x, y is just that constant. If, there, if there's something else, then, then it's all curvy, and that's the case we're looking at. So we're doing this curvy L shape with three out of the four sides being zero. But because the last side is non-zero, something funny can happen. OK, so back to this eigenvalue equation for the x's. I think you should know what goes here. The solution is, so we can do it. You know, you can, like, doing this from scratch is a chapter 10.3 problem, and, it, and you can really, you can do it in, like, gory detail over, like, 10 minutes. You can do the case where lambda is negative, the case where lambda is positive, the case where it's 0, and you can see, like, when can it work out with these two things being 0? How could it possibly work out? And for when it's zero, when lambda is zero or lambda is negative, there are no non-trivial solutions and, and everything goes away. So this is a whole story, but we're going to skip the story because we've done it many times and we're just going to go to the answer. And the answer is that, that they are sine functions and the period of the sine function has to be perfectly tuned to make this happen. So the solution, the solution, so I'm skipping, you know, I'm skipping all the work because we've done it before already. And you are responsible if that works. So you should know how to go from this thing to uh, the solution I'm about to write. But you know, today we're learning a different skill than that. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on doing that over and over again. The solution is that x of x is a sine function. It's the sine of n pi x over a. So the a came from this boundary condition that x of a equals 0. And lambda is n pi over a squared. So this is the solution to that boundary value problem that we've done a bunch of times before. It is sines and uh, these integer things squared. So n is 1, 2, 3, and so on. So that is the, the x dependence. And that is not much different than in the wave equation or the heat equation. Same kind of thing. The only maybe thing that was slightly different was I had to pick out the left and right boundary conditions to use. So you have to know of the four boundary conditions, these two in particular get used now to make this, this thing happen. So that is the eigenvalue eigenfunction part for the x's. Let's look at what happens for the y's. And this is going to be genuinely different than before. So again, this is coming from the same separation of variables. Um, but we have a minus sign here. And that makes the equation different. So the equation is that y double prime of y over y of y equals lambda. So before it was a minus lambda, now it is a plus lambda. And we have already determined what lambda can be, could be from the x's. So lambda must be n pi over a squared. So this is n pi over a squared. And that came from the x values. Uh, so this is a positive number. What is the solution to x double prime 
equals n pi over a squared. Let me, let me, let me call it y because that's what it's called. y double prime is equal to this constant n pi over a squared times y of y. So this is not sines and cosines anymore because this number is positive. So because this is a positive number, the solutions are not sines and cosines. They are exponentials. So the general solution is exponential. So it's e to the power n pi over a y. That's one solution plus e to the power minus n pi over a y. And as usual, you can put arbitrary constants in front of them. I'm going to call the constants c and d. So sometimes we call them c1, c2, but I'm going to call them c and d today. And that's because they're going to depend on n. So when I do the superposition principle later, there's going to be n is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4. So I don't want to use 1 and 2 now um, because it'll get in my way later. So I'm going to call the constant c and d. That's the general solution. I will do a side, a little side note here, is that you can also write a different way to write the general solution would be with this cinch function. So you could write uh, a times the cinch of n pi over a y plus b times the cosh n pi over a y. So these are both perfectly correct. This is the general solution where c and d are arbitrary constants. This is the general solution where a and b are arbitrary constants. So anytime you have two independent solutions, you can add them together and get the general solution uh, like this way. So these two exponentials are independent solutions. Cinch and cosh are also two independent things. These are the hyperbolic sine and cosine. I think it is better to do it this way because I don't know what the hell these things are. So if you are an expert at hyperbolic sine and cosine and you have a good understanding of what they mean and what they are, then I think this way is great. Um, and it's like slightly mathematically nicer than this way. But if you don't want to like learn what hyperbolic sine and cosine are, you already know what an exponential is. I think this way is perfectly good. So I'm going to do it this way. The textbook does this way uh, with cinch and cosh. And I'll explain like the relationship as I go. But I think this way is, is perfectly, perfectly good and won't confuse you. So I'm going to do it that way, not this way. So if you've never seen these functions before, you can uh, breathe a sigh of relief. We're not going to need to know them. You can totally never learn cinch and cosh in this course. That's totally fine. OK, so we found the general solution for the y's. Uh, and now what we're going to do is we're going to use the top and the bottom boundary conditions. So, so far, I have used the left and the right boundary conditions in this x calculation. Uh, but I haven't used the top and the bottom yet. And the top and the bottom are going to tell us something about these constants. So that's what we're going to do. And in particular, I'm going to look at this bottom boundary condition. So the bottom boundary condition right here is going to tell us something. Get a new piece of paper. So I'm going to be using the bottom boundary condition. So that says that u bottom of x equals 0. And this is for all 0 less than x less than a. And what that means is that the function u, ux at y equals 0, that's the bottom, is equal to 0 for all 0 less than x less than a. But u of x uh, and 0 is x of x times y of 0. So that's 0. And what that means, again, this is true for every value of x. But it can't be that the, the function capital X is always 0. It's got to have at least one non-zero value. And at that point, we can conclude that y of 0 must be equal to 0. So we can cancel out the x of x at any of its non-zero values. And we get this thing, that y of 0 equals 0. So because of the bottom boundary condition, y of 0 has to be 0. Uh, so because y of 0 equals 0, we can plug that in. And we can get something about these c and d's. So if you plug that in, so that's what I'm going to do now. Plug in y of 0 equals 0. You plug it in, you get y of 0 is equal to c times e to the n pi over a times 0 
plus d times e to the minus n pi over a times 0. These are exponentials with a 0. We know what that is. That's a 0. Uh, sorry, it's a 1. <laughs> c times 1 plus d times 1, which is c plus d. So y of 0 is actually equal to c plus d, but you just told me that y of 0 equals 0. So this is 0. So there we go. We have one equation. 0 equals c plus d, and that means that d is equal to minus c. So the, it looks like we have two possible constants. It looked like we had two possible constants, c and d. But actually, because of this bottom boundary condition, the two constants are related to each other by d equals minus c. And that gives us the general solution. So just using that, we're going to have the general solution. So this is equal to d is minus c. This is the same as c times e to the n pi over a y. You know what? Let me not write it here. Let's, let's start a new page. So, so uh, what have we used so far? We've used uh, the y equation with a y differential equation plus the bottom boundary condition. That gave us that uh, y of y equals c times e to the n pi over a y minus c times e to the minus n pi over a y. So the constant d got replaced with minus c because d is minus c. And you can rearrange this as just c times e to the n pi over a y minus e to the minus n pi over a y. So the function y of y is, is this thing with one constant c. We just have one constant. Uh, this is where I'm going to give you the side note again. This function is what the textbook calls 2 times the cinch of n pi over a y. So if you, if you want to work in, in textbook language, the solution is actually something nice in terms of the cinch function. But uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not assuming you know what the cinch function is, so I'm just going to leave it like this with exponentials. So this gives the general solution. So we have this y of y is this. x of x we knew is a sine function. So the solution we found, uh, x of x times y of y is the sine of n pi x over a times c times e to the n pi over a y minus e to the minus n pi over a y. That is x of x times y of y. And what is the general solution? So this solution depends on some particular n value. You tell me what n is. I can tell you what this thing is. The general solution is just superposition over all possible n values. And if you do that, you get the general solution is u of x, y. So superposition, I'm summing up over infinitely many possible things. The coefficient c now depends on n, so I'm going to call it cn. And now we have the same thing as before, n pi x over a times e to the n pi over a y minus e to the minus n pi over a y. So there you go. That's the general solution to Laplace's equation. So far, we've used the left and the right boundary conditions for the, to find the sine function for x. We used the bottom boundary condition to find out this relationship between c and d. We have one set of coefficients left over, these cn's, and we have the top boundary condition. And by using the top boundary condition, you can solve for the coefficient cn, and that's going to involve this inner product thing that we've been doing. So that is not really different than anything else we've been doing. The details are going to be like a little tricky. There's going to be some, you're going to have to plug in some numbers here and, and stuff. So I'm going to do the details after the break. They're also in the notes. Um, but hopefully you can see the connection between this equation and the heat equation. And the difference is that instead of having an initial condition, you have this top boundary condition that is sort of playing the role of the initial condition. And we had this bottom boundary condition that was figuring out how, how to go from two constants down to one constant. So that is a little bit different even though the eigenfunction stuff was the same. So I think we'll take a break here. Uh, we'll come back at 10.15. This is a good time for questions. I'll open it up um, over the break as well. And then when we get back, we'll solve for the CN, and we'll, uh, we will uh, also have hopefully have some time for to review some things as well. Uh, OK, 
So let me open this up in Top Hat. I will see you guys at 10.15 to come back. Uh, so you can you can uh, post a question in Top Hat or in the chat. Uh, someone says, just to be clear, this is you top. Uh, the thing I've written down, this is the function you everywhere. So this is the solution inside the rectangle. So we're looking for this unknown function u. We're saying, what is its value inside the rectangle? And I found a formula for it. And the formula only depends on the constant cn. And so far, I've used the left, the right, and the bottom boundary conditions. And by choosing the cns correctly, I'll be able to match the value at the top. And once I match the value at the top, I'll have the solution everywhere in the middle. So this is, I would say, this is the general solution everywhere. And what I have to do is I have to solve for the cns by using u top. That's what we're going to do after the break.
Okay, it's uh, ten fifteen. Uh, we're gonna get started up again. A uh, couple good questions that came up uh, over the break. Uh, so one on top hat, somebody said, "Hey, you forgot the constant when you were doing the x function." So indeed, when I was doing the x function, that was this bit. Uh, I had this equation, and I had this this. Uh, these two boundary dot data, x of zero equals zero, x of a equals zero. And I said the solution is the sine function. Uh, but that is not the general solution. In general, there should be a constant here. So any constant uh, will work. So I think what I have found is a solution. I haven't found the solution. And that's because you could multiply this by any constant and it would still be a solution. Uh, however, I knew that later on we're going to multiply it by this function y. So the thing that matters is not x of x on its own. It's x of x times y of y. And I knew that there were going to be constants in y. And so if you had put a constant here, some arbitrary constant here, it would have gotten multiplied by the constants in y of y. And then you would have ended up with a redundant constant that you would have gotten rid of anyway. So it's not wrong to put this in here. You're going to end up later on, it'll end up going away and not mattering. And that's why I didn't do it. And I knew that that was going to happen because this is exactly the same as what we did for the heat equation. And that's what happened there. So uh, that's why I didn't do it. You would have ended up with the same final answer for you uh, because you would have gotten rid of the constant later anyway. So that's a very good question, though. Uh, why is that I didn't do it? I just knew I had to find a solution. I knew I didn't need the general solution. Uh, somebody asked, what boundary condition would the bubble uh, what boundary condition would the bubble look like on a non-horizontal straight line? So I think they're imagining if the bubble, if you take uh, the bubble and you, you want to make the bubble a, uh, like a flat piece, but not horizontal. And in that case, the two ends are, are lines. And at the two endpoints, at the top and the bottom, they are flat. So I think if you have boundary data where two opposite sides are constants and the two sides, the other two opposite sides are lines that connect them, then you'll end up with a flat uh, function, which is a plane. So those are the questions that I could answer from uh, the uh, chat. Some people also had a few exam questions. I'm, I'm hoping to have a little bit of review time at the end of this class, um, maybe like half an hour or something. So let's save all the exam questions for that. So I'll answer some of those uh, after we finish the math so we don't get off topic. Uh, some people also had some questions in the chat, so if you want to, I. If you want to read up on those, you can as well. Uh, okay, so the last thing we got to do is solve for the CNs by using U top. So U top of X is some arbitrary function, F of X. And we're going to figure out what the constant CN are. And the formula is going to be something involving F. So it's not surprising, it's going to be some integral involving F times some other things. Uh, oh, there was one other good question, which was. Somebody said something like, why do you plug in the thing that depends on y to get the to get the x? Yeah, when we are solving for the x equation, why do we use the boundary conditions involving y? So let's go to here where we did this. So you say, hey, these involve y. They involve y, but they are at x equals 0 and at x equals a. I think that that is a key thing. So. The reason I plugged in the left and the right boundary conditions, those are at a fixed value of, of lowercase x, at lowercase x equals 0 and at lowercase x equals a. So they tell you what happens on the left and the right at fixed values of x. And indeed, that's what the information I got at the end of the day was at those x values. So I, if I plugged in something that depended on x, I wouldn't be able to tell, like, it wouldn't be one specific x value and it wouldn't be the information I want. So because this is at x equals 0 and x equals a, that's how I knew that that's what I wanted. So that was that's another good question. And it does seem like a little counterintuitive at first. Um, but if you think about it, it makes sense. Uh, I also think it helps to think visually. So we're, we're, we're plugging in at the left and the right uh, boundary conditions because we want to know about what the x function is doing at those two points. OK. So finding the coefficients, this is no different. If, you, if you've understood this inner product thing, this is no different than anything else we're doing. You know, technically, you, if you're a Fourier series expert, you can just phrase the whole problem as find the Fourier series for the function f or something. Um, but what I'm going to do is show you this inner product way. I need the formula. That's the only thing you need. And I'll say again, everything I'm doing today is all in the notes that are posted online. So if you find this all going kind of fast and like you've lost track of like what is what, it might help you to watch the video again 
and go over the notes at the same time or just read the notes. Maybe you work better that way. Um, but yeah, so, so it is there if you need it. Okay, so solve for the CNs. So u top of x equals f of x. What is u top? u top is u of, at the top, I got to plug in y equals b. So u of x b is u top, which is f of x. So what I got to do is I got to plug in, plug in y equals b. This is the secret, the secret sauce uh, to this thing. So I'm just going to plug in y equals b into this equation. And so I'm getting f of x is u of x b on one hand. And on the other hand, it's this big infinite sum. And I'm just going to plug in y equals b. So what do I get? Cn sine of n pi over ax. And here is where I'm going to end up with some b's. So it's e to the n pi b over a minus e to the n pi b over a with a minus sign. So you end up with this, these funny b's in the answer, and they're just going to be there. Like, there's no way to get rid of them. Ah, they're just going to be there. That's very funny behind. OK. Uh, so this is the equation. Now it's just Fourier series. you got to extract the coefficient cn. So extract. So this is something, again, this is like another like fundamental PDE skill that you have to have. Some people like to do it with Fourier series. They just think uh, the Fourier series for f matching something. I do it with inner products. So I'm going to do the inner product, the inner product of both sides with the sine of n pi over ax. And if you do the inner product of the left-hand side with sine of n pi over ax, you get this inner product, f of x sine of n pi over ax. And if you do the inner product of this side, uh, OK, now see, now I have a problem because I'm calling this n, and this is also n. So things are confusing. Let me switch to m. I'm going to extract the coefficient cm. m is 1, 2, some number for some. Let's switch to m, sine of m pi over ax. So when you do the inner product over here, because the sine functions are orthogonal, the inner product of sine of n pi over ax and sine of m pi over ax, that inner product will be 0. So of this big infinite sum, n equals 1 to infinity, not n equals 1 to b, uh, the only term that will survive is, is uh, uh, the mth term. The mth term is the only term that survives. When n equals m, all the other terms go to 0. So somebody in the chat noticed this b and said, why does n go from 1 to b? And it was because I was excited by my b pun and wrote it down. Uh, it is not correct. So it should go from n equals 1 to infinity. OK, so uh, do the inner product. The only term that survives is only surviving term is when n equals m. So you get cm. Then you get the inner product of sine with itself sine of m pi over ax, sine of m pi over ax. And then you multiply by this constant. So you have to know that constants get pulled out of the inner product. When you do the inner product with constants, they just live on the outside. So this is times e to the n pi b over a minus e to the minus n pi b over a. OK, last step. You should know what this inner product is. The inner product, the average value of sine squared is a half. The interval we're working on is from x from 0 to a. So this is equal to cm times a half times a. The length of the interval is a. And then multiply by this funny thing, e to the n pi b over a minus e to the minus n pi b over a. So pretty crazy formula here in the corner. Uh, cm times a half times a, e to the n pi b over a minus e to the minus n pi b over a, some crazy thing. That whole thing is equal to this inner product of f with the sine function. And if you just rearrange this, you get a formula for c. So let's make sure that I got the right answer. I'll just match it with the notes and make sure we got the right thing. So the formula is cm equals uh, Yeah, 2 over a, so a times a half becomes 2 over a, times 1 over e to the n pi b over a minus e to the minus n pi b over a. So this is why the textbook, this thing is called like a cinch. 
And so it's just easier to write cinch everywhere if you know what cinch is, and that's why they do it that way in the textbook. But it's a little uh, confusing. If you don't know hyperbolic geometry or hyperbolic functions, all of this times the inner product of f of x with sine of m pi x over a. So that's the formula, and it depends on the function f. You know, in some a particular thing, we maybe we'll give you a function f and ask you to calculate this. Uh, and in fact, the textbook does that. So if you go into the textbook and you, uh, well, that's not what I wanted. Let me go back here. So let me show you a picture from the textbook. In the textbook, uh, they did this problem and they computed for a particular function f, which is a triangle function. So it's linear and then it's linear and down the other way. So this is example one in the textbook and you can see what it looks like. So let me turn off this. This is what it looks like. So, and it's it's like we said, it's a three-dimensional L shape. So it's pointy on one side, and then it kind of gets flat on the other side. And they show you the kind of the side view, and they also show you the top view here. And the function is slowly sloping down. And that's what you get if you just plot this function u of x y that we found with the coefficient c m like we found. Um, one thing that is uh, different is. I did it with u top being non-zero. They did it with u right being non-zero. So the x's and y's between what I did and what the textbook did are flipped. Uh, but you know, it's still the same special case. Ah, OK, someone asked you a question. What are the bounds of the inner product? And I think it's from 0 to a. And that's because the inner product is with functions of x. So the inner product, the inner product f of x sine of m pi over a x is the integral from 0, 0 to a of f of x times the sine of m pi over a x dx. And I knew to do it from 0 to a because I was doing x functions. Uh, yeah, so somebody says, could you use Fourier series to find the coefficients rather than the inner product? You get the same thing. Yes, that's totally true. So the way I'm doing this thing with inner products is totally exactly equivalent to Fourier series. All of Fourier series is really the same as this inner product stuff. Um, the advantage is if you do it my way, all these like funny details like the two over a and the like one over all this stuff, like that should come out sort of naturally. Like I didn't have to specially think about like where do these go? It just was in the algebra. Where if you do it with Fourier series, you sort of have to like memorize like when is there a two, when is there not a two? Um, so if you prefer that, that's fine. Uh, could you write the constant in terms of Fourier series? Oh, yeah, so the CNs, yeah. So the whole thing is really the same as Fourier series. So I think that's what the question was. OK. Uh, yeah, so if you have a good way to memorize this, the other, the other thing that makes it, I think, extra tricky, memorizing it the Fourier series way, where did I end up over here? Um, remember, we're working on the interval 0 to a. So we, yeah, let's, we're working on 0 to a. This is the interval, and we have sine functions, sine functions only. So that's what we were doing. We're working from 0 to a. We have sine functions only. And when I did inner products, I didn't have to worry about this. I knew that the sine functions were orthogonal. If they were cosine functions, it would have been the same thing. But if you want to do it with Fourier series, like the technical way, you have to worry about like even extensions, the sine Fourier series versus the cosine one, and like 0 to a versus minus a to a. So to me personally, I think there's less room to get confused and make a mistake when you do it this way with inner products. Um, it is more from scratch. So you have to like kind of know what's going on. If you want to memorize more stuff, that's totally fine. But like, just don't get mixed up by these things. Uh, so that's however you want to do it is fine. We're always going to ask questions where uh, no matter what way you do it, as long as it's correct, you'll get the right answer. Um, OK, that is all the whole thing for Laplace's equation except for what to do in not the special case. So if you remember what we did, we started with a special case. I wrote the word special case somewhere. Where are the words special case? Here we go. I wrote the words special case. This is only one side is non-zero. And the next top hat question is going to ask you, what do you do if there is more than one side that is non-zero? So that is in top hat. Uh, that's what we've seen so far. We've seen how to solve it uh, when one of the boundaries is non-zero. But what do you do if more than one is non-zero?
turn the microphone off. Most people have answered on the top hat already. Uh, so uh, I'm good think, I think there's only a few people left. How many people are on the actual stream here? OK, great. I'm going to, there's like five people left. So I'm going to uh, stop it. Uh, in the chat, somebody asked a good question. Uh, if instead of the top being the, the, the non-zero part, so that was from zero to A on top. Let me see if I can find the, the picture. Yeah, here we go. So the top went from zero to A. If, and that was, U top was the non-zero piece in the problem I did. You could imagine the same exact problem with three sides that are zero, but it was those three sides, and U right is the non-zero thing. And in that case, the integral go, goes from zero to B. So that is exactly right, and that's what's in the textbook. Uh, so you can follow along with the textbook example if you want to see it that way. Uh, in my notes, I did exactly what I did with from 0 to A. OK, let's see what you guys said about uh, in Top Hat. What do you do if more than one side is non-zero? And let's see what people said. Superposition is exactly right. So this is a linear equation. If somebody has two non-zero pieces for you, you can solve them separately and then add them together. So let me write down a couple words about that. But we're, it's not, you know, you don't have to redo uh, uh, everything. It's going to be super quick and easy by superposition. So let's let, let u1 of xy solve the equation with uh, non-zero data on top and let's let u2 solve the equation I gotta switch markers here let's say on right so this U1 is exactly what we did. U2 is the textbook example. Uh, the fact is then, if you just add them together, U1 of xy plus U2 of xy also solves the equation. And it has non-zero on both the top and the right. It solves the equation with non-zero data on top and right. And so you can check that. The way you would check that is you would, if this solves the PDE and this solves the PDE, if you apply the derivatives, you do the 2x derivatives, you do the 2y derivatives. If you apply to this sum, you'll see that because derivatives are linear, that this also solves the equation. You can check all the boundary data and you'll see that it has the right boundary data. It's zero on the left and the bottom because these two are zero on the left and the bottom. And it'll have the data you want on the top and the right. So in practice, this is how you solve it. You do all the math I did for this one special case where three sides are zero and one side is non-zero. And then if you wanted to do more than one non-zero side, you would solve each side separately and then just add them all together. And that is what, we're, what the superposition principle lets you do. I think there are a couple of textbook problems that in the homework that have you do this like and work out the details. But really, that's the, the main idea. It's just superposition. So if you've understood the superposition principle up until now, that is one more application of it. Uh, so somebody in the chat asks, you take one side being non-zero at a time. That is exactly right. So you, whenever, you, if you have to do more than one non-zero side, I would just do each side that is non-zero one at a time on their own. And then at the end, add them all up. Uh, if you set your boundary conditions up with two non-zero cases, would the exponential term just end up being the same as the superposition pr principle answer? Yes. So you, there's more than one way to get it. So um, in the bubble case, like the picture I showed you, it had two non-zero things. So you could have done those separately and added them together. Or there is a way you can solve it all uh, at once, and they give you the same answer. So I think this way of doing it separately always works, and that's like a, a nice way to do it. OK, so let me open this up for questions. And then I do have a little bit of time. We can do like a little bit of review uh, on a couple of things. Um, and if you have any questions about the exam and stuff, you can also ask me now as well. I'll answer the math questions first. So let's, uh, let's open this up. 
So questions on Top Hat. Um, and actually, let me also open this up as well. I have um, a little poll for PDEs, what you want to review. So you can also put in your answer there. Uh, this is all. OK, but the exciting thing is that's it. There's no new topics in the course. We did everything. In PDEs, we did the heat equation, the wave equation, and Laplace's equation. And we did how to do non-homogeneous things. Uh, all of them are using the same tools over and over again. So if you get good at like the fundamental math tool, uh, the, the little parts aren't that bad. OK, let's see if people have questions. Yeah, so this is a question, how long is the final exam? So we are aiming to make it about the same length as like the one that you were supposed to get. So that one is two and a half hours long. We're going to make it, I think, a little bit longer just like because the format is different. So it, it should be the same length, like physically as that, like same kind of overall amount of questions and that kind of thing. And so that will help you compare for all the practice exams you can do online. So that is about the right length. I think we're going to give you a little bit longer than two and a half hours in case there's like bugs and things. So, so maybe like three hours or something. We're still like working out the details and we're trying to like err on the side of giving you a little bit of extra time rather than making it super time crunched. So it is about the length of the old exams. It'll be approximately two and a half hours, but maybe a little bit longer. Uh, could we have a review session? Yeah, we're planning to do some, some review sessions with the, so we're coordinating with the TA and the other instructor or we're going to try to like run something. So it's important you guys like start studying now so you can come up with good questions. So that'll probably be next week sometime. Uh, do we have to write anything or is it all multiple choice? So there's going to be questions that are multiple choice. There's going to be questions that are like fill in the number. So like calculate some number and then like type in that number. And then I think there will also be some questions where you have to write like a short explanation. So like a good example would be the very last question on the midterm that said like, is this argument correct or not? And like a correct answer is just like, oh, these things are not independent. So something like that where the answer is no, because they're not independent is also something we might ask. Um, so something that we can't really ask is like show your work to like derive an equation that's like difficult, but something like give me a short explanation or like fill in the blank that that's totally legit. Uh, yeah, so actually, so some people are asking about accessibility. I have already been talking to accessibility services, so you can email me to like double check if you want, but I have everybody who has accommodations and we have like a way to accommodate everybody. Uh, but if you're concerned about it, definitely email me and we can make sure that's okay. Okay. Yeah, somebody, this is a math question. If you have four non-zero boundary conditions, are there four terms in the general solution? Yes, so you can, you can solve it the way I did here and solve four different equations and then add them all together to make it work. Uh, that is totally what you could do. That would be a big, uh, a lot of work. Um, one thing you can do, and like, you know, this is optional. If you remember, let's go back to where I did this thing. So if you remember where I solved, I found the general solution C and D, and I used the fact that U bottom was zero. That meant that D was minus C. So uh, that was like one thing I did. So I went, I got rid of the D variable. If U bottom was like equal to U top, then like you would get something else. So you can actually, if you want to like save time and you don't want to just add up four things, you can pair off the boundary conditions. And so you can do, you can add it, write it as like a top and a bottom. You can try to do them together. Um, and so that will sometimes work. So in general, it's a sum of four things, but in some special cases, it can be a sum of just two things. And I think there's a textbook homework problem that's like that. Um, but if you have four non-zero boundary conditions, are there four terms in the general solution? I think in general, yes. So I'm doing this question. Let me, let me write yes. Yes. Why? Well, something happened. OK. There we go. Yes. OK. Um, Can we review guessing the Riemann sum solving method? I don't know what that is. So you should tell me what that is. Guessing the Riemann sum. Or maybe guessing the Fourier sum. Riemann sum is something else. Maybe like the, yeah. Uh, somebody asked in the chat, in the YouTube chat, uh, does everything we did work only on a rectangle? And yes. So what we did today and what, we'll, what we're asking you for is the Laplace equation on a rectangle. 
you can do a little pass equation on like any shape and it becomes like more complicated. So the textbook even has something on how to do it on a circle, but that's we won't test you on that. So you don't have to learn the on a circle part. Uh, so somebody says, do we use U top as the initial condition for all cases? The only reason U top was the quote like initial condition is because U top was the only non-zero side. So in the example I did, three sides were zero and U top was non-zero. And so you should use whichever one is non-zero. That's what you should do. Um, yeah, so. OK, so I think I've answered most of these. I'm sorting by likes, so you should like any questions that I didn't answer. OK, yeah, so somebody said, last class we tried a summation for the equation ut equals uxx plus e to the tx. Could you review the, this method? So why don't I, let me review that method in the context of what we just did. So that method is let me find the page. There is this. Uh, not that. Not that. Not that. Not that. Where did it go? Okay, so um, the method that is being asked about is can you go from, there's, there's more than one way to go from an equation like this to the value of the coefficients. So you have f of x equals, and you have this big sum over here with, with c n's, and then you can do this inner product stuff and solve for the c's. That's what I just did. But let me show you an alternative method, and this is the method being asked about. Um, so here is the alternative method. And the alternative method is you start by writing f in terms of the sine series that you know it has. So the first step is you write f of x. You write that as the sum of some coefficient times the sine of n pi over ax. And n is going to go from 1 to infinity. So you have to figure out what those coefficients are. In the example that I was being asked about last class, I knew what these coefficients were. They were like minus 1 to the n. So in general, what are they? There's some coefficients. Let's call them uh, let's call them a n. And there's a formula for a n. A n is going to be something like uh, two over a times the inner product of f with sine of n pi a over x. So this comes from something like the sine the sine peer, the sine Fourier series for f. And so once you have that, then this equation up here becomes it says that the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of a n times the sine of n pi over a x. That's equal to this sum. So this was, this was step one. OK, so f was this thing. f is also this thing. These two things are equal, and now you can equate the coefficients. So step two, I guess, is equate the coefficients. So you get this, equ this equation, a n is equal to c n times e to the n pi b over a minus e to the minus n pi b over a. Uh, so that is a different way to solve for the coefficient c n. Um, and it should be equivalent to what we did uh, the only difference is if you have the coefficients and to start with, maybe this will save you a step. So this alternative method is totally equivalent to what we just did. I mentioned it last time, and here it is again. OK. Uh, somebody asked, will the final be able to pause and save and resume just in case an internet disconnect and stuff? Yes, it can do that. So if you get disconnected, you won't lose your work. And that's part of the reason we're giving extra time. Uh, yeah, this method is optional. So as long as you can get to the coefficient cn, like if you can start with this thing and know how to solve for cn, how, whatever method you want to do is totally fine. Uh, so just whichever you prefer. And in some cases, one will be slightly easier than the other, but I think they're, they're mostly the same. Uh, OK, other questions? 
Yeah, so in this superposition thing that I mentioned, u1 and u2, each of u1 and u2 has exactly one side that is non-zero. And so when you add them together, you get two sides that are non-zero. So in general, you'd have to do this four times. Um, you'd have u1, u2, u3, u4, and you would add them together. You'd add four things together, and then you'd have a non-zero on all four sides. If the shape was a hexagon instead of a rectangle, then you're like really in for like a hard, hard work. So that like you can do it, and it's like hard math, and it's like I like vaguely learned how to do it in grad school, but don't worry about it. It's fine. Is the final exam cumulative? Yes. So it covers everything in the course. The emphasis is on things like since the midterm, but uh, uh, strictly speaking, like the way you should study is you should look at the learning goals that have been posted throughout the course and like learn those. Like that's what we want you to know. That's how we're gonna make the exam. Uh, okay, I think that was all the, let me see what people said for what to review in PDE review. What did people say? So I'm looking at this. Yeah, okay, so people want to review how to solve for the coefficients and how to solve for the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. So solving for the coefficients is technically like, that is like Fourier series. So we did it kind of quickly because you guys should have seen Fourier series before. I know it is a slippery topic. So let us, um, let us do uh, another example or something. Um, so I think very typically what happens, and actually this is a good exam question, right? Uh, if I give you the general solution to a PDE, so I say the general solution, uh, I'll give you the general solution, and then I'll give you the initial data, and I'll ask you to solve for the coefficients. And when you solve the PDE, for the first thing you got to do is find the general solution anyway. So let's do an example for the heat equation. Let's do the heat equation. Let's pretend that the general solution is, suppose the general solution is u of xt equals the sum of e to the minus, uh, let's do n squared t, and then we'll do cosine of n, uh, cosine of nx. And let's make n start from 0. Let's make n start from 0. 0 to infinity. So, so some heat equation, the, heat equ the solution to the heat equation with some boundary conditions, some BCs, is, so there's some particular boundary conditions and some setup that gives you this. And let's say this is on the interval on 0 less than x less than pi. So there, this is some particular boundary conditions. This is the general solution. And there should be some coefficient cn. And the question might say, find cn if u of x comma 0 equals, I don't know, what's a good function? Let's do the function 7. That's my favorite function. It's always equal to 7. So uh, how would you solve for this? And I think maybe this is part of the confusion is there are a few different ways you can do it. So one is we're definitely going to be plugging in t equals 0. So no matter what you do, you should plug in t equals 0. And when you plug in t equals 0, you're going to get that 7 is equal to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of cn times e to the 0, but e to the 0 is 1, times the cosine of nx. So this is equal to u of x0. So after you plug in t equals 0, this just becomes a Fourier series problem. This is writing the cosine Fourier series for the function 7 on the interval 0 to pi. So that is one way to do it. Think of the Fourier series. Another way to do it is to do this whole inner product game. If you can do the inner product game, you've got to worry about what are the interval. But that's sort of given to you, so it's not too bad. If you want to do it the Fourier series way, you can do that as well. And then you have to, I don't know, worry about cosine series and all that. If you want to do it that way, that's fine too. Uh, yeah, so somebody in the chat asked a good question, which is, for solving the coefficients, why can we do the inner product from 0 to L instead of minus L to L? And that is because when we're doing it from 0 to L, we're not doing it. We're, yeah, OK, let's do it this way. So if you do it from minus L to L, that applies to the I guess in this case, the even extension 
of function. So if you're going to do it from minus l to l, first you have to take the function from 0 to pi and extend it to a function from minus pi to pi. Uh, so l is pi here. So, and then you do it on the even extension. And instead of doing that, you can just always work on 0 to l. So, and this is on the original function. So those are your two options. And they're both, they both come out with the same thing. So that maybe is the confusion. When you're working from minus l to l, you're not working on the function 7 from 0 to pi. You're working on the even extension of the function 7 from 0 to pi extended to minus pi to pi. So the minus l to l goes with the even extension, whereas 0 to l goes with the original function. Um, and so when you do this, this, this thing, you can, uh, you can get it uh, either way. I think this way is easier. I usually do it this way. Uh, by the way, this one has a really easy answer. So you should, this one you should be able to do just by looking at it. You look at it and you go, bam, oh, that's easy. Um, so I'll do it in a second here. Um, so yeah, so somebody said, do you need to multiply by two? The thing is, if you multiply by two, you're going to be multiplying by two on both sides. And so it shouldn't, it shouldn't affect what the final answer for the CNs is. So either way is fine. And as long as you are doing the right steps, both of these will work. And in one of them, you will be multiplying things by 2, but you'll be multiplying both the left and the right side by 2, and you'll get the same final answer. So it shouldn't matter which way you do it. So let me do this one. I think hopefully you see what the answer is here. So let me do it like this way. Let's do the inner product. I'm going to work from 0 to pi. So the left-hand side is the inner product between 7 and the cosine of mx. And the right-hand side, when you do this sum, because the cosines are orthogonal, you end up with cm of the inner product of cosine of mx with itself. And I know that this one this is the integral of cosine squared on from, from 0 to pi. That's cm, average value half, Length of the interval is pi. So cm times a half times pi. Now I've got to do this integral. It's the integral from 0 to pi of 7 times the cosine of mx dx. This integral uh, is easy. So it's from 0 to pi, it's the integral of cosine of mx. So you can write it down in terms of signs. Like you get the exact answer. But I claim, so okay, you could do this. There's two options. Again, lots of options. Do the antiderivative. So you get this, you know, 1 over m the sine of mx dot dot dot. That'll give you the right answer. But I'm going to do it this other way. And the other way is to just say the integral of cosine, cosine, if you look at the graph of it, it starts up here and it goes below and then it is negative. So it's it's positive as much of the time as it's negative. And if you flip it over, you'll see that the positives and the negatives are exactly balanced. So cosine, maybe it looks like that. Maybe it looks like that. Oh, I guess what, what is the third one? Like that? OK. No matter which what m is, as long as you have a non-zero number of these, the, the integral of cosine is always 0. Uh, the only way that you get something non-zero is if m equals zero. And when m equals zero, when m equals zero, cosine is, is one. So this, when, co when m equals zero, this is the, the cosine of zero is one. That's the function seven pi. Uh, so then you get something non-zero. But on all these cases, you get something that is always zero. So th this integral um, is equal to, it's equal to seven pi if m equals zero or it's equal to 0 if m is bigger than 0. And I did that just by looking at what I know about cosine functions. So that's one way to do it. If you want to do it this antiderivative way, I think you guys will prefer that way. Um, but to me, it's always good to have this kind of like check on like what, what's going on. So that makes sense to me. Um, so that's 7 pi if m is 0. It's 0 if m is bigger than 0. And that's equal to cm times 1 half times pi. And that means that c0 equals 2 times 7, and cm equals 0 for m bigger than 0. 
So there is a quick example problem that I did. Um, you could also do this by orthogonality. The function 7 is the cosine of 0. So uh, th these are orthogonal, unless m is 0. Lots of different ways to do it. Is the inner product way recommended? That's the way I like to do it. It makes sense to me. It connects with linear algebra, which I, you know, is something else I know about. So everything makes sense. But you could do it however you want. Doing this antiderivative is totally fine. Um, we'll give you like a table of integrals as well on the exam. So like, however you want to do it is great. Uh, so that's finding the coefficients. Are there other questions about finding the coefficients? Yeah, I don't know. Let me start doing somebody. The other popular thing was finding the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. So let me do a, a quick little recap of that. I won't have time to do a full problem, but I'll just remind you where it is in the textbook and that kind of thing. So this is in, in chapter 10.3. And we had problems like this. We had x double prime of x plus lambda times x of x equals 0. And we had things like x of 0 equals 7 and x of 8 equals 3. Uh, that was the kind of thing uh, we had in, in chapter 10.3. Uh, and the way you solve this is just how we do everything in this course. So we find the general solution first. The general solution is sines and cosines. So the general solution is C1 sine of square root of lambda x plus C2 times the cosine of square root of lambda x. Let me say this is in the case if lambda is bigger than 0. So in the other cases, it's slightly different. It turns out lambda bigger than 0 is the most important case. So that's why I'm going to do it here. So this is what we did in chapter 10.3. There were two unknown constants, C1 and C2. And there were two uh, pieces of data, x of 0 and x of 8. And when you have two pieces of information and two unknown constants, normally you can rearrange the equations and solve. So we got two. So let's say normally two unknown constants c1, c2, and then you got plus two pieces of information. This guy is this guy toast. Plus two pieces of info, x of 0, x of 8. So if you have two unknown constants and two pieces of information normally, then you solve it. But this, that's what normally happens. But there is like a wrinkle that can happen, and that is what happens if x of 8 and x of 0 are actually giving the same thing? And that can happen because we're looking at periodic functions. So when you plug in x equals 0 and you plug in x equals 8, if that's an even number, number of periods apart when you plug them in, then you don't actually have two pieces of information. Then x of 0 and x of 8 represent the same piece of information. So this is normally what happens. But there's this, I called it a degenerate case, which maybe you guys haven't heard of. I was assuming you'd heard that before in linear algebra. But this piece, this, this situation where you have, I don't know, repeated information, repeated info, and that's if, what if x of 0 and x of 8 are giving the same thing? So x of 0 is c1 times the sine of square root of lambda times 0 plus c2 times the cosine of square root of lambda times, times 0. And this one is sine of square root of lambda times 8 plus c2 times the cosine of square root of lambda times 8. And my markers are really running out here. So if, it, if these two things happen to be the same, then you don't have two pieces. You don't have two different pieces of information. You just have one piece of information. And in that case, you cannot solve it. And in that case, there is more than one solution. And this happens, happens if square root of lambda times 8 is a multiple of pi. So when, when the thing you're plugging in is a multiple of pi, then you have this degenerate case and you have non-zero solutions. And that is really what the eigenvalue eigenfunction thing in chapter 10.3 is doing. We're looking for the values of lambda where we have this repeated information case because that's the case where we have non-zero solutions. And so this is where this whole thing comes up. And so I think you, you might need to review this uh, chapter 10.3. We did it a little bit quickly because it's just taking old ideas from the course. 
things like being able to solve this guy and combining it with this new idea of what happens if the information is repeated and when does that happen. So that that is the I the the like high level view of the eigenvalue eigenfunction thing. I do think it's the kind of thing like everything else in the course where you just need to practice uh, doing a bunch of these problems. Okay, it is eleven. I think I'm going to stop there. You guys should post lots of practice like questions you have in Piazza, that kind of thing. Uh, we are going to try to do some like review sessions and things. I have been skyping with a few people like who asked for like office hour type things, so definitely feel free to reach out. Uh, that's it for the course, I guess. So yeah, good luck studying, and we'll be in touch this week and next week on on hopefully helping you guys study. Um, definitely check out the learning goals. That's how we make the, the final exam. So I'll stick around here for a little bit. Uh, if you have more questions, you can put them in the chat. Uh, maybe I'll open up one more question thing on, on uh, Piazza. Yeah, somebody, uh, th when I first posted the old exams, they, they were locked on Quirkus. They should be unlocked now. So if you tried it like yesterday and it didn't work, uh, try it again. All right, I'm going to open this up on, on Top Hat for more questions. Uh, but yeah, that's it. No, I can't. <laughs> Okay, I think I'm gonna end the stream here. Uh, yeah, definitely keep asking questions and good luck with all your studying.